I'd like to welcome everybody and just start off and explain that we're at the Cayley Club of Rhode Island. Woo! I love it. Without the Cayley Club of Rhode Island, we wouldn't be here. This is a very important cultural institution. Uh, 1954, I believe it was uh, opened up here. And all those decades that have gone by, the same kind of educational and cultural experiences that have been held in this room and downstairs. We're very fortunate that we have this space as Irish Americans, and people should try to treasure it, support it. If you're not a member of the Cayley Club, there are applications downstairs. It's a good thing. You'll get a newsletter. There are activities from September to June on a weekly basis, and it's very important to support this. Excuse me. Thank you. And they do support. This event right here is sponsored by what is known as the 1916 Committee. The 1916 Committee got back to get, got together, was formed in 2014 in preparation for the 100th anniversary of the 1916 Easter Rising in Dublin. For those years leading up to the 100th anniversary, we had many educational events. We talked about the heroes of 1916, men and women. We talked about the coverage of standing up to the British Empire and fighting for nationalist freedom. One of the things that we did that we're very proud of is that we had fundraisers, we collected money, and we built a monument to the heroes of 1916 that's down at the Rhode Island Famine Memorial Monument down on the Providence Greenway. One of the statements on that monument is sad but true. It said that on April 24th, 2016, the 100th anniversary, six counties were still not free in Ireland. That remains true to this day. And it's one of the things that we constantly talk about and work on. We have a speaking program on a monthly basis from September to June. The last time we were in this hall, our own Don Dagnan gave a lecture on Willie Pierce, Patrick Pierce's brother, and his contributions. In May, also last year downstairs, Gareth Pendergrass from the Newport War College gave a speech on the Irish Civil War, which is very educational. And the last act we had last spring was the annual hunger strike commemoration that we have every year down at the Irish Family Memorial. Um, the thing that we have also been involved with, besides lectures and cultural things, is the 1916 Committee has taken on a serious approach to the Brexit situation in Ireland and the United Kingdom. A banner there says what we mean, no hard border in Ireland. This is a political statement. There are people in the 1916 Committee who have been lobbying a congressional delegation Marie McGee over here has spearheaded that effort, met with Cicilline, met with Langevin, is working on Reed and White House to get our delegation to understand that what the Brits are doing is once again ignoring the interests of Ireland. A hard Brexit is going to create a disaster on the island of Ireland. It would probably end up with a hard border and violence could be returned as they rip apart the Good Friday Agreement. The Good Friday Agreement in 1998 was fostered in many ways by Americans and the brave people of Ireland who agreed to establish a frictionless border in Ireland. It's been successful all that time. However, the decision to leave the European Union has jeopardized that 20-year peace. So if at the end of this uh, lecture downstairs, people want to talk to Maria, myself, we'd be happy to get you involved with the letter writing campaign, et cetera. In the back of the room, we have a raffle. We have a raffle every time we have one of these lectures. The purpose or the funding that we get from the raffle is to finance the music that you'll hear downstairs after the lecture. Tonight, we're very lucky that the Exiles are playing down there. The Exiles are Bob Druin, who's on vocals, guitar, and fiddle. 
Torin Ryan on pipes, flute, and whistle. Rob McConaughey, vocals and piano. I'm dying to see a piano down there. <laughs> and Dean Robinson playing the Warren. So that's the paperwork here in the beginning. We're gonna start the presentation in just a couple of minutes. At the end of this presentation, I'll have a few more remarks about some upcoming events that you should be aware of. But for right now, I just want to uh, introduce the speaker, Tricia McAvoy, who I met in Newport at a book launch. Two men came over from Ireland. This is the book. It's called Counterinsurgency and Collusion in Northern Ireland by Mark McGovern. Trisha heard about it on Facebook. She reached out, met people, and went over to Newport to the Hibernian Hall, where the author and a cohort of his gave a lecture. In a nutshell, what this book does, it documents in the 1970s almost 100 murders of nationalist people by paramilitaries from the loyalist side that were supported by the British Army. It sounds like a far-fetched thing. It's what Sinn Féin had been saying for years. This book documents it. One of the people from the National AOH who was there said that with the libel laws in the United Kingdom, if they could have found anything in this book that wasn't factual, they could have stopped production. So this book is uh, its a heavy read, but it's very, very educational. After the thing, if you want, you can find it. You can order it on Amazon or through the publishers. But that was the day we met Trish. Trish got up and said some very powerful things in that hall, in the hall. And I asked her if she would be so kind as to come here and speak, and she agreed. We're very lucky to have her husband, Martin, is with us. He is an iTech guru, from what I understand. And for the first time ever, we might have a PowerPoint presentation that goes. <laughs> hold your applause, please, hold your applause. <laughs> I, I, I hope it works out. All right, but <laughs> Tricia is now a physician in the Westerly area. She lives in Westerly, went by, and she has two high school students down at Proud, right, Proud um, High School. And I'll say this, Trisha is very nervous tonight, and understandably, and I'm gonna say this, Trish is not a public speaker, nor is she a historian. I know we have historians in the audience here. But what Trisha is, is somebody who saw history, and in her own small part, she made history back in Northern Ireland in her youth and young adulthood. And she's gonna tell us that story tonight. Another thing that she is besides a physician, and you can tell she's a dairy girl. <laughs> and if, if you haven't seen Dairy Girls on Netflix, you want to download it and have a binge week because it's hysterical. Um, we're going to start now, and the way we're going to start, if you can kill the lights back there, is we're going to see a video called the same thing as the title of this speech. The town I loved so well. And then Trish is going to take over. Thank you very much. in the 
my favorite songs. I think it really captures the sentiments of the struggle of the people of Derry. But now I want to tell you my story. So first, I would just like to start off by telling you a little bit about my family. So I'm the second youngest of a family of eight children. And I guess this is me when I was about seven or eight years old, outside my home. And I'm just going to ask them to lower the lights a little, just so you maybe get a look at it better. Um, in the waterside area of Derry. There we go. That's me. And I was the second youngest, and I had um, six older siblings. And so here we have my six older siblings. My six older siblings, there we go. Um, and so this picture was actually taken before I was born. Um, and as you can tell, they're almost one generation older than me. So myself and my little brother here, we were the two youngest in the family. So, I was born in Derry in 1967, and the troubles would officially start about two years later, and they would continue for 25 years. That would be all of my childhood and most of my young adult life. So to help you understand a little bit about the history of Derry, I really need to take you back to the 1920s in Ireland and tell you a little bit about partition. Now I know that many of you here will probably be really familiar with this part of Irish history. But I think it's useful to go over this because it really does explain why this unjust partition led to such misery for so many generations in the city of Derry. So Derry is part of the province of Ulster, one of the four provinces of Ireland. And Ulster, as you probably know, consists of nine counties. But at the time of partition, the British goal was to create a state which included the maximum amount of land, but also had a very strong Protestant majority. And there was no way that they could do this by including all of the nine counties of Ulster. So by deliberate gerrymandering, three of these counties with majority Catholic population were just omitted. And the borders of the remaining six counties were altered so that they could exclude as many Catholics as possible. So, by 1967, what did that gerrymandering mean for the people of Derry? And why did Derry become such a flashpoint throughout the Troubles? Well, by the 1960s, Derry had already suffered four decades of sectarian discrimination and repression by a government who openly stated that they wanted to set up a Protestant state for a Protestant people. So poverty and deprivation were part of life. There was a 1961 census in the city of Derry, and it showed that 67% of the population were from the Catholic majority. But yet in the local government elections, there were 20 seats, and 12 of those seats were held by the Unionists, who only represented approximately one third of the population of the city of Derry. So how did they manage to do that? Well, you didn't get a vote unless you pay taxes on a house. So if the Unionists could control who could get a house and where that house was located, then they could continue to control the number of seats that they would get. So to give someone a house was to give someone a vote. <coughs> so the city was divided geographically by the River Foyle. And on one side, we have the Catholic population in green, the majority. And this was the per city side. 
Now across the river on the water side, the area is in red. This area was the majority of the Protestant community. That's where they lived. So the idea was not to give anyone a house in the water side because that would upset the gerrymandering. And so that's why the Catholics were denied homes and that's why they were corralled into areas over here in places like the Bogside and the Cregan, because then their vote, the power of that vote would be limited. Jobs were also allocated on a sectarian basis. The unemployment rate was approximately 30% among Catholic men in Derry. But 90% of the senior ranks in the civil service were held by unionists. And they would only give a job to their own, essentially locking out all Catholics. <clears throat> so as a consequence, the poverty and the deprivation was rife in Catholic communities. Several different families all had to live in the same home. They just slept on each other's floors. They didn't have individual families, family homes. But we were one of the very lucky ones. My father had a job. He worked as a butcher in town and he held that job for as long as I can remember. And my mother had grown up in the waterside. And before I was born, they lived with their family in my great aunt's family home. A small house, but they managed. But they really saved very, very hard, and they tried to get a home. And my mother really wanted to live in the place where her family had lived before her, which was the waterside area. That was going to be impossible for a Catholic. But again, we had good fortune. My mother had very many good Protestant friends. So what happened was one of these Protestant friends offered to use his name to bid for a house for her because a protestant would never sell a house to a catholic in this area of time because again that would upset their gerrymandering so we were very fortunate that house was sold to us because the owner assumed he was selling it to a protestant family so given all these conditions and the inequalities prevalent in Derry in the 60s, it's probably hardly surprising that this is where the civil rights campaign began. Because the people of the Bogside and the Cregan, they would take the lead in demanding change and equality. So I can tell you honestly that I don't actually remember anything about the Battle of the Bogside in 68. And I don't remember when the British troops first came to the streets of Derry. And nor do I remember the very early days of internment, when there were mass arrests and imprisonment without any trial. But I do remember Bloody Sunday in our house. I was four and a half years old. And I remember it was a Sunday afternoon just after Christmas, a chilly day. I didn't understand what was going on. I just knew something terrible had happened because everyone was crying and I didn't know why. And I had never seen so many adults in tears. My father, my sister, and my brothers all attended that peaceful civil rights march. My sister, who was 19 at the time, went to that march. And very recently, in preparation for this, I actually asked her to share her memories. And I'm going to read you what she wrote to me. Daddy had already arrived back when I arrived. The names of the victims were not released. There were only rumors of how many were dead and hurt. Doctors and nurses were called into Alt McGalvin Hospital. We waited in trepidation for each family member who was out to return home. Jared was the last in, and he went straight to the bathroom. He 
and he came out red-eyed. He was 15 years old, and he had witnessed some of the worst. People were sad, stunned, and in disbelief, because even if they didn't know the individuals, they knew someone related to them. People were angry as the news reports came through, calling the victims gunmen. Too many people witnessed what happened, and they knew the victims were ordinary, decent people. The whole Catholic community was in mourning. At the same time, there was rejoicing in the British Army camp, where it was deemed a great victory. There was a lot of anger and a quiet eeriness on the streets as details of what really happened spread and of the Army's reaction to these murders. Many, many young boys signed up to join the IRA in those days that followed. My sister writes, to me personally, that was the day it all became a justified war. The whole of Derry and thousands more went to the funeral mass, which was broadcast outside. Shops and schools were closed, many people still in disbelief. I remember standing at the roundabout outside Craigan Chapel as the 13 coffins were taken past, their families wailing and crying. Everyone was crying. So that's my sister's account. For me, that was the day everything changed in my family. I just sensed something. The whole atmosphere was different. My mother stopped singing as she did her housework. My father always looked drawn and worried. This is my first true memory of the troubles. So I was about four or five when the army raid started. And they continue for about eight or nine years but not regular enough that you would ever get used to them. And often it would be in the middle of the night or the early hours of the morning. And I would be awoken out of my sleep by an unmerciful banging at the door. And then the next thing I would hear is those English accents. They would storm through our house. There would be confusion and panic. And then a soldier would come in my bedroom, point a gun at me, and tell me to get out of bed and get downstairs. I was about five years old. I would watch my father and my brothers as they'd be pushed around and made to stand up against a wall with their hands above their heads. My 70-year-old great aunt lived with us. She too would be forced downstairs and we were all ushered into one room. I knew she was scared because she would mutter prayers under her breath the whole time. Then the army would go through our house, every room, every drawer would get pulled out, everything. And it was also well known that during those raids, the army would plant incriminating evidence and then come back later in the night and arrest people and charge them with crimes. So my father had to accompany them around the house. And that was a great responsibility because you had to watch their absolute every move. And there could be 20 of them trying to go into all different rooms. And he had the responsibility of making sure they didn't plant explosives or guns in our house. Meanwhile, the rest of us would be all held in one room. And when they didn't find what they were looking for, they would arrest my father and my brothers. And that was a scary thing too, because we all knew about the stories of abuse and torture, and there was extractions of false confessions. And of course, my younger brother, Jared, he always got the worst of it. He would be taken away for days on end for questioning, and we wouldn't know where he was. They wouldn't tell us. He could be at the local police station, or he could have been taken away to one of the interrogation centers like Castle Ray, and he could be held there for days on end, and we just wouldn't know. And then, when he was released, he would be brought home by my parents, 
and he'd come in home and I would see his shirt was all ripped, his buttons were pulled off. It was clear to me what had happened. But he never spoke about it. He never said anything. We would ask him questions and he would just laugh it off and say, well, you know, I gave them as good as I got. But after a raid, I have to tell you, life would go right back to normal. So even though they might happen in the middle of the night and we may have only had a few hours sleep, I would still be sent to school. My father would still go to work and my sister at the time would still be sent to work. So one raid took place in the very uh, early hours of the morning. My older sister, was taking a very important exam that day. It was the A-level exams. And the significance of these exams were that they were the reason that if you got a good enough grade, you made it into university. So I'm sure it was very intentional that the raid happened on that morning to disrupt things as much as possible for us. My sister was late for that very important exam, but she went ahead and she took it and she did go to university. So in our family, there was this definite sense that, you know, no matter what they do to us, we're just going to keep on doing what we would want to do. We're not going to let them pressurize us. We're not going to let them intimidate us. We're just going to keep on living our normal life. Another raid happened on a late afternoon. And I was out playing with my friends in the street. The only one at home was my 17-year-old sister. And she'd just gotten home from school. She was still in her uniform. Now, when the army came down our street, we always knew it was for our house. And I remember thinking, she's in there all alone. She's going to be so frightened with all those men with their guns. And should I go in and help her? And then I realized, that as a seven-year-old, I would probably more, be more of a hindrance than a help. And then she'd have to watch me as well as keeping an eye on those soldiers who might plant something. So I had the sense to know that maybe the right thing to do was not to go in. So I sat on a doorstep and I watched from afar. I was seven years old, wondering if I had made the right decision to leave her all alone. So despite everything that was going on, life continued in our community. There were bomb scares, there were riots and barricades and checkpoints in the town center. There was restriction of our movement. There were security checks. Every time you went into a shop, you had to open up your pocketbook and be searched. Sometimes there were body searches. Uh, my brothers and sisters were constantly stopped in the streets by British soldiers, asked where they're going, where they're coming from, uh, and had to be body searched. And that might happen three or four times as they walked down the street, especially if they were in their school uniforms, because then they could be identified as Catholic. But what I want to tell you about this story, this was one of uh, the good days, as I thought. It was my fifth birthday and I was going shopping with my mother and I was allowed to pick out a birthday present for myself. So it was a shop called Wellworths and that's a bit like uh, Walmart. It had absolutely everything. So I picked out this beautiful doll and we were just about to go up and pay for it when the bomb alert was announced. Of course, that meant drop everything and run. But I remember a few seconds arguing with my mother, you know, please, please, can I take the doll with me? <laughs> but of course, I was told in no uncertain terms, no. And she just grabbed my hand and we ran. So I always thought that I wasn't allowed the doll because we hadn't paid for it. But in reality, it was probably more likely that carrying anything could have delayed our escape. And so the other thing that happened very commonly in these days was that when an IRA bomb warning 
was called into the police force, they wouldn't pass it on in a timely fashion. They would hold it back. There would be a delay or some kind of miscommunication. And that was because they actually hoped that innocent civilians would be caught up in a bomb planted by the IRA, even though that was not the intention of the IRA. So because of that, I think my mother realized that even though there was a warning, that the bomb could actually go off at any moment. But we did get out of the shop, and we were running up the main street, and we probably got about halfway up this hill called Shipley Street, and there was an unmerciful bang. And I turned around, and there was just this big plume of smoke. So I'm guessing that my mother felt really relieved that we got to safety. But I have to tell you, I didn't. I was really upset because I just remember thinking, that beautiful doll, I really wanted it. And now, no one will ever, ever play with that doll again. And as a five-year-old, I just didn't understand why that had to be. <coughs> So when I was around seven or eight, my brother went on the run. That means that he had to cross the border into the southern side of Ireland to avoid being arrested. And after that, the harassment on my family was really stepped up. The raids continued, but they were much more sporadic. So that was even more frightening for us because we always assumed if they came to raid our house, it meant they probably saw him somewhere in town on that side of the border. And because we all knew about the shoot to kill policy of the security forces, we feared for his life. And it may be days and days before he was able to contact us because we knew our phones were tapped. As a child, I even knew that I could never say his name in conversation, never give anything away because his life depended on it. If I saw him in the street, I knew, even though he was my big brother, that I had to just walk straight past and pretend I didn't see him because there were surveillance everywhere and that would have been too dangerous for him. I don't actually know my brother's involvement to this day I don't know where he stayed or where he went when he disappeared, but my mother would tell us, don't ask him any questions and then he won't have to tell you any lies. And that was the story. And to this day, I still don't ask him questions. So Derry was right on the border with Donegal. And that's where our family would go to escape all the pressures of things that were going on. Usually a Sunday afternoon. My father worked really hard. He worked six days a week and had Sundays off. And he spent it with myself and my younger brother because the other family members were older. But it was a treat for us on a Sunday to get away to the beach or the coast in Donegal. It was particularly important around the time of the Orange Parades and the Apprentice Boy Marches because they were always times of great trouble. And what would happen is because we lived in the waterside area, my mother wouldn't even let us outside of the door. There was always stories and incidents where these Protestant gangs would be drinking after the Loyalist parade, and they would just simply try and find a Catholic to beat them up. Um, and some of them beat them to death. So. That was a time of great intimidation. So we would always try and get across that border, get to Donegal, get to the beach where things could be much more relaxed. But even that was difficult because at that time, all the old border roads were completely closed off. Um, there was one checkpoint, one way to get across to the south. And that checkpoint was manned by British soldiers. All the other little roads that existed, that exist today again, they were closed off by barricades. Um, sometimes they were blown up. Sometimes the bridges were blown up, specifically by the security forces, so that no one could pass. 
So the only way to get across the border was through this designated checkpoint. So you could wait on a beautiful day in the summer for two or three hours with the lines of traffic all trying to get through this checkpoint. But for my family, that wasn't the end of the story because once they recognized our number plate, we were pulled out for special treatment. So what that meant for us is that we would get to the border and we were told to get out of the car, that they needed to search it, our car was pulled aside, and we would simply have to stand there, sometimes for hours. And after all that, they would just sometimes just say, hey, it's okay, you can go. Other times they would say, we're taking your car, and so someone else would have to come and pick us up. And of course, if my older brothers and sisters happened to be driving, they were always arrested. So there was one particular evening after a really great day at the beach that I remember. And we were all tired. It was myself, uh, my little brother again, and uh, my mother and father. And so we were coming back home. And as we expected, we were pulled over at the border. But in this particular occasion, they told us that they were taking all of us to Fort George. Fort George was an army base in the center of Derry. I had never been taken to a place like this before. And how were we taken there? We were told to get in the back of an army Saracen. So this was a big, they used to call them the pigs back in the day. And I, at the age of about seven, and I was very small, and I couldn't even get up to get into the Saracen. My father had to lift me up to put me in the back. And my father and my younger brother and my mother were forced to go in this Saracen. And we drove to Fort George. So Fort George was a place that I had seen, but I didn't really know much about. It was just a big, fort in behind, lots of barricades and heavy doors. And so it was my first time to be in there. And the doors opened and we were brought in and we were told to get out of the Saracen. So we were just left there to stand in the cold. And they, they said that we had to wait because they were, our car was being searched. So we waited quite a while in that cold. And all I remember was just a big yard with soldiers and lots of army vehicles. Now I need to tell you a little bit about my father for this story. My father was a very quiet man and he was a very religious man and he actually was a pacifist and he believed that there was never an occasion where it was justified to take a life. And I often argued with him about that point but that was who he was. So he really must have been at his wit's end that particular night. Because what happened was that one of the soldiers lifted his rifle and pointed at him and said to him, if we get your son, we're going to put a bullet in the back of his head. My father turned right around and said, not if he gets you first. <laughs> So I was totally, totally shocked at this coming out of my father's mouth. It was just so uncharacteristic. But I have to say I was really proud of him. Because, you know, we believed, I personally believed that we always had to show some form of resistance. We had to let them know that that kind of intimidation wasn't going to work for us. People often say to me, you know, how come life just went on as normal? It's kind of remarkable. You all just went about life in the midst of everything that was going on. And when I reflected on that, I think I know why. I actually think that that was the reason why. Because we wanted to make sure that we just carried on with our ordinary life so that we could show them that their intimidation tactics didn't work, that we would still go to school, that we would still go to our jobs, that life would go on no matter what they did to us. So being pulled over by British soldiers with English accents was one thing. But being stopped by soldiers 
with the same Northern Irish accent as me. That was truly, truly terrifying. And that was because that was the UDR, the Ulster Defence Regiment, a unit of the British Army. They had a treacherous reputation because they were recruited from the Loyalist communities and many members were also part of the Loyalist gangs, the paramilitary murder gangs who sought out Catholics to murder. And this unit of the British Army were renowned for passing on information. The guns that they were supplied were also used in the murder of Catholics. And so we were very, very afraid of these men. So one particular night, um, we were driving home and it was shortly after a major event had happened. And I need to tell you a little bit about this event so that I can set the scene for you. So in 1975, something happened that was called the Miami Show Band Massacre. Some of you might know about it, maybe some of you don't. But what happened here, there was an innocent band of young musicians and they played around the country. And they were playing in Dublin. And then they were making their way back up to Northern Ireland after a late night gig. So they were stopped at what appeared to be a British military checkpoint in men wearing British Army uniforms. These men were, in fact, a Loyalist murder gang. So they ordered these young innocent men who had no association with paramilitaries. They ordered them out of the, the van and a bomb exploded and this gang opened fire on these young men, instantly killing three of them and injuring two more and just leaving them for dead. It would later come to pass that we would find out that four of those gunmen were actually members of the British Army's unit, the UDR. So that's why they held such fear for us. So this particular evening I'm going to tell you about. We were again traveling over the border for our Sunday afternoon at the beach. Again it was myself and uh, my parents and my younger brother. So we were stopped at the checkpoint and of course this time it was a UDR checkpoint. For me I didn't really realize what that meant but I could tell that my parents were very, very uneasy that something was going on. They just let us go by, they did the usual, where are you going, who are you, and that was it. In fact, it was almost suspiciously easy that they just let us go by. So that day, I could tell my parents were worried. So on our return journey, they decided to take another route because they were truly afraid that that same UDR unit was going to be waiting on us and that they were just going to take us out and shoot us just like they'd done a week or two earlier with the Miami show band. So we took another route home. A very unfamiliar route through country roads and it was very frightening and very eerie in the dark of night. And I remember my parents arguing back and forth, had they made the right decision to go this way? Was this an even worse decision? Because it was very common for army patrols just to jump out of a hedgeway and pull their weapons and pull you over. And so the lonelier the road, this, the more worried we got because that might be more likely that you would be pulled over in those circumstances and shot because they had opportunity. So while we were traveling in the car, my parents got more and more frightened. And my mother started to say the rosary. Now in our house, when you started to say your prayers under those circumstances, it still frightens me today, to this date. It usually means something terrible is going to happen. As a family, we would say the rosary every night, but this was different. It was that sense of this mumbling, 
under her breath, prayers, with that tension in her voice, not even saying the words properly. But that was the signal to me that something really, really awful was going to happen. And I was really scared as a child. And I really thought that we were going to be pulled out and shot. We weren't. We made it home safely. We were very lucky. But that kind of fear never goes away. And if really, you know, you think about it, these were the forces of law and order in your country. They had absolute power over you. Absolute power. You had no defense. And so I still to this day have memories of that. And I'll tell you, when I watch movies, and I watch movies about Nazi Germany, and I see the Nazis rounding up the Jewish people in that fear of the forces of law and order, ultimate power over you, and want you dead. That fear resonates with me still. I can't really tell you what it's like, but it's a horrible, horrible feeling. So I want to say, when people start talking about IRA terrorists and what they were doing, you have to realize that the only people who were there to defend the communities were the IRA. They were the only ones we could turn to, the only ones we could trust. And so it's very, very clear to me, in my opinion, who the real terrorists were. So getting back to just life in, uh, in Derry, you probably know that there would be no mobile phones in those days. And so, you know, we always knew something was going down. We always knew something was happening. And there were many, many different signs. Um, you've probably heard about how the people of the community would use the trash cans. We call them the bin lids. And we would make lots and lots of noise. And that would be sometimes to warn if there was a raid coming or British soldiers coming. Um, we would know if something was going down because sometimes the helicopters would be out and they would fly really, really low because they were on surveillance. So my older brothers thought it would be awful funny to tell me that the helicopters with the red flashing lights, that those ones were Santas. So as a little kid, I would be sitting waving up for hours at the helicopter with the red light thinking Santa might see me, only to find out a few years later that all aircraft have a red running light. <laughs> and sometimes we would listen to the police messages on the radio. And back in the early days, they didn't actually have secure frequencies, so we could listen in. And for example, if we heard them report that there was a sniper attack on the army, and they might even go as far as to report that the sniper was, for example, wearing a blue jacket and jeans. We would all go right home and we would put on our blue jackets and our jeans. And we would flood the streets in the hope of causing confusion and the hope that that sniper would get away. So we did have some lighter moments as well during these troubles. And uh, one of my favorite stories is about my closest friend's mother. Her name was Mrs. Boyle. So Mrs. Boyle, she was a long-term teacher. And she taught in uh, one of the local primary schools, which would be elementary school. And she taught there for years and years, I want to say decades. So she knew all these kids really well. She knew their families, she knew all the siblings, and she really knew them well. And she herself was a very well-known lady in the community. So she lived on the edge of town, very close to the Bogside area, where a lot of the riots would take place. So the young lads would go out to riot, and they would put on their their ski masks, or what we call balaclavas, and they would have the holes cut out. Um, but Mrs. Boyle would say, 
she knew every one of them. She would say, she would just look at their feet and she could tell who they were. <laughs> so now whether or not it was uh, out of respect for Mrs. Boyle or sheer fear of Mrs. Boyle, when they would see her coming with her shopping, the lads out rioting literally would say, stop lads, stop the riot, Mrs. Boyle's coming down the road with her shopping. And they would all hold fire with their petrol bombs and their stones. Mrs. Boyle would come on by, and now very often she would know them, and she'd call them over and she'd say, I know that's you, Johnny, and I'm going to have to tell your mother, get you back home now. And, but once Mrs. Boyle had passed safely, the boys would say, right lads, back at it to start back and firing the petrol bombs. So Mrs. Boyle told me another story, another fairly funny one. I mean, just anything that was a bit lighthearted would keep us going. So this other story, uh, she was sitting outside one day on her, as we called, windowsill with her neighbor. And a young lad, a young lad came running down and he was being chased by the army. He was being pursued and trying to escape. So the young lad came past them and he ran into a neighbor's house. So the house that he ran into uh, was a family of five girls. And so the army were in pursuit and they started to do a house to house search because they were trying to find him. And now people in those days, in that sort of circumstance, everybody would try to help, you know, they would try to help this young man. And so what happened in this house, five girls, took him, swept him away, took him upstairs, and what they did was they got a big dressing gown, they put it on him, they got a towel, they put it on his head, they got a face mask, put it on the face, and they rolled up the trouser legs and they put shaving cream on his legs. So the army came and they came to that door and as they did, they would go into the house and they would say to the man of the house, account for everyone in this house so the man said oh it's just me and my six daughters upstairs and so the army would just rush him by and run on up and so he shouted after them listen my five daughters are up there six daughters show a little respect please they're not half dressed and so the said uh young man who they were in pursuit of would get all wrapped up in the dressing gown, pretend to be very embarrassed, and the British soldiers went right past him, and he got away. <laughs> so now I, I, I have another story for you. Um, I have to be careful how I tell this one, because we're not laughing at this young man, I have to point out. But there was another young man in Derry who was always out rioting. Now this poor young man was unfortunate enough that he was unfortunately born with a genetic condition of dwarfism. So he was only about three foot tall. And so that was not a very common condition in Derry in those days. So pretty much everybody knew who the poor guy was. He couldn't get away with anything. But he'd still be out rioting and he'd still be out hijacking cars. So we never laughed at his disability. But the funny part to us was that the same guy would go out and he'd put on the balaclava and he would think that nobody would recognize him. <laughs> so the whole of Derry knew who he was and unfortunately the whole of the British Army knew who he was so he kept getting arrested over and over and over. And so I have another little legendary story to tell you about. And, and this one's actually a little bit sad because very often um, the army Land Rovers, and, uh, they would just come flying through the roads. They'd want to get to their destination quickly. And unfortunately, there were some accidents, especially with young kids playing on the street. So kids were hurt, knocked down, and unfortunately there were some deaths. But this story is actually about a wee dog. So this poor wee dog was knocked down accidentally by a speeding army Land Rover. And the story goes that the kids of the area 
they saw that this little dog was a victim of the British forces, why he was out on active duty. And so the children decided that they needed to honor the animal with a full military funeral, just like they'd seen the uh, IRA do for their volunteers. So they dug a little place on waste ground and they buried the poor dog and they all lined up and they wore their combat jackets and the same balaclava ski masks and the oldest boy he in military style would call out the orders so instead of the volley of shots that the IRA would do these kids got stones so they did a volley of stones over the grave and then they planted a placard and the placard read Volunteer Patch McGuire died on active duty fighting the British forces. <laughs> so, you know, I wanted to say that basically when other kids around the world were playing uh, cops and robbers or cowboys and Indians, we played IRA against the Brits. So that's where that came from. So the next thing I want to tell you about the biggest event in my life was the hunger strikes. And so at the time of the hunger strikes, I was about 14 years old, a very, very impressionable age. So it's probably no surprise to hear that that was the time when I really wanted to get involved in the fight for freedom. I would join illegal marches in support of the hunger strike. I would go out and I would bang my trash lids and the bins. And I would do my best to try and get close to the riots. I would try to get involved, but I was just a little too scared to actively take part. But I did attend the wakes of Patsy O'Hara and Mickey Devine, two of the hunger strikers who were from Derry. So standing in that room, that was a powerful moment for me as a 14-year-old. I was filled with sadness and anger, and at 14, not really knowing what to do with those kind of emotions. I could so easily have joined up. I really could have. I think I was just a little too young, a couple of years older, and my life could have taken a very, very different course. But my parents, had a strong, strong belief that getting a good education is going to be the key to standing any chance of overcoming all the sectarian bigotry in Northern Ireland. So they really, really encouraged us with our studies. And I was very lucky to avail of the free education and attain a place at university and medical school. However, I was one of the very few Catholics in my year who had that privilege. And even beyond university, when I was qualified as a doctor, again, I faced prejudice in finding a job. And there were limited career opportunities, as the majority of the higher posts in the hospitals were held by members of the unionist community, who would be very, very reluctant to ever give a Catholic a job. I did, however, come to work in the emergency room in the main hospital in Almagalvin, in Derry. And there, I have to say, I witnessed and I treated many plastic bullet injuries. And the victims of these injuries were usually children or young adults. These plastic bullets were used by the security forces, and they were often shot randomly into crowds. And witnesses would often report that they were used to target individuals at close range, aiming for their heads. So it's no surprise to hear that there were many deaths related to those plastic bullets and rubber bullets. And again, sad to say, they were children. But one particular memory I have while working in the ER was actually an incident when a British soldier was brought in. Now he had a self-inflicted gunshot wound, which accidentally happened when he was cleaning his rifle. And I have always taken my Hippocratic Oath very, very seriously. 
and I knew that it was my duty to treat all patients equally, as I believe I've always done. And so on this occasion, I treated my patient, I evaluated him, I gave him pain relief, I gave him antibiotics, and I ordered his x-ray. But when he came to the hospital, he came with a whole unit of the British Army, because they would come also for his protection and accompanied by their commanding officer. So in our emergency room, they would take up positions wherever they wanted. They would stand at the corner with their guns. They would intimidate. And in fact, this particular commanding officer came up to me and I quote, he said to me, this is an effing Fenian hospital and you're going to do what I tell you. I want my man out of here now you're going to read that x-ray. But the sound of that English accent to me brought me right back to when I was five years old and when I was ordered out of bed by a British soldier and a gun to my head. But I wasn't five anymore. The tables had turned. I was no longer intimidated and no longer in that very vulnerable position. Things would be on my terms now. So I simply told him no, I wouldn't read that x-ray until I had attended to all my other serious patients first. So after waiting around another 20 minutes or so, he just came in and grabbed the x-ray, told me he was taking his soldier with him and he would have an army medic deal with it. And I was glad to see them all leave. But I felt that I had to establish my resistance in some way. When any member of the security forces were ever hospitalized, for whatever reason, they would have a plain closed security guard with them. And they would get a private room in the hospital, which unfortunately the rest of the patients didn't have the luxury of that. And when that guard came with them, they would sit outside their door and I would watch. And they would be a little twitchy and a little nervous, and I could see they would have a big hold all full of weapons. But then as the hours went by, they'd get a little bit more relaxed, get their coffee, get their magazines out. So as soon as I thought they just looked a little bit too relaxed, I would go out and I'd get the crash chart, the cart, the crash trolley. <laughs> and so I would come pounding through the sliding doors and these guys would jump up pull their weapons and only to realize that it was just one of the doctors and it wasn't a threat but i was going to do my bit and i was not going to let them sit in my hospital occupying my country without feeling some kind of pressure that was my bit i felt an obligation So those are some of my stories, but I'd like to finish up by telling you someone else's story. I'd like to tell you about a young girl called Annette McGavigan. She was, the, she was a 14-year-old girl, and she was fatally shot by British soldiers on the 6th of September, 1971. She was the 100th civilian to be killed in the Troubles and she was the first child. Annette stepped outside of her home in Derry during a lull in the rioting to collect rubber bullets that littered the ground. And this was something that kids often did just as a pastime or for school projects. And she hadn't participated in any riot. She was in fact still wearing her school uniform and she was holding an ice lolly at the time when she was shot in the back of the head by a British soldier. No one has ever been charged with her murder. <clears throat> Later, a pathologist's report would suggest it was a direct shot to the head, which contradicted the army reports that she was killed in some kind of crossfire or a ricochet bullet. Her family, to this day, continue to seek justice for her. So, this is Annette, and she's featured in one of the famous murals in the Bogside. And this picture 
was entitled Death of Innocence by the artist. And what you can see is she's wearing her school uniform, which really signifies her innocence. And right behind her, you can see the chaos of a bombed out building. And over here, we have a gun, and the gun is broken. And so that was to signify the end of violence. And I think most importantly here, up on this left corner is a butterfly. And we know that the butterfly signifies hope, it signifies peace, and a new era for the people of Derry. So to me, to be honest, this butterfly has always signified the Good Friday Agreement. This was a delicately balanced agreement that created the conditions for peace in Derry and in the rest of the North. So 25 years later, I can say that a lot has changed. Political unionism has lost its majority in Northern Ireland. And equal rights are there for all citizens. That's a reality now. But just like the fragility of that butterfly, our peace process is in jeopardy. I believe we're at a pivotal moment in Irish history again. That British Tory government and all of their arrogance have ignored the democracy in Northern Ireland because the majority of people, as we've heard, voted, and they voted to stay within the European Union and not to leave with the rest of Britain. But that act of democracy was completely ignored by the British government. So if Brexit happens without some kind of deal for Northern Ireland, what will happen is a hard border with repartition will happen between the North and the South. And what that means in reality is the stories I told you about the barricades and the checkpoints and the soldiers with their guns, <coughs> that's all going to become a reality again. And we just cannot go back there. We cannot. So I'm telling you all my story tonight because I have a purpose because I actually really need your help. I believe that we have never been closer to Irish unity, yet at the same time, we've never been further away. There's only one leveraging tool that we have over the British, because they will never do anything willingly or without pressure to find a solution for Ireland. And that tool is the U.S. trade deal with Britain. Because Britain desperately needs that trade deal to survive. And it's the only leverage there is. Because they don't respond to the democracy of the Irish people, they will never listen. But they will listen to pressure from the U.S. So I need every single one of you here today, every one of you, to lobby your representatives, to ask them to act on behalf of all Irish Americans, and ask them to block that trade deal unless the British government will guarantee that there will be some kind of deal or backstop for Ireland. So I hope that you will all join me in fighting for continued peace and prosperity in Ireland. And well, in the words of Phil Coulter, I can only pray for a brand bright new day in the time I loved so well. Thank you.
yes. and gotten pulled over. You said before that they shot them, that a bomb went off? Um, yeah, you know, I am, um, I will tell you the story as I know it, but as I say, this is just my recollection. So what happened was that the, this uh, loyalist gang, they planned to actually place that ball oh, in the back okay. without the knowledge. And what was going to happen is that van was going to travel into the north and it was going to explode. And what that was supposed to, their idea would be that all those men would be killed. It would be assumed that they were IRA activists who had been blown up by their own ball. But actually what happened was accidentally the bomb exploded and it actually killed two of that murderous gang because they were trying to place it. And once that happened, there was pandemonium, as far as we know. And that gang opened fire on all the men who they had made stand outside and kneel on the ground, and they literally just shot them. And the two that were left, they didn't mean to leave them alive. They actually thought they were dead. One of them crawled off into the undergrowth, and they fired shots after him, and they thought he was dead. But they lived to tell the story. And the real point that I was making here is that the people who were found guilty, the weapons that were used in that crime, belonged to a legitimate British Army unit, the UDR. I hope Thank that... you. No, that's very good. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Sure. I just wanted to say that uh, Jimmy gave you an introduction where you weren't supposed to be a good public speaker. Well, right. <laughs> you weren't comfortable yeah. with it. And uh, not a historian. And I have to say, probably for everybody here, that a lot of us have spent much of our lives in the cause of Irish freedom in our own way. And we go to so many events and ceremonies and this, that, and the other thing. But I think every once in a while, we need to hear a first person account so it brings us back to reality so that we remember so distinctly while we're still fighting for the same thing you're fighting for. Thank you. Likewise, I want to return the compliment because uh, really we would never be where we are today in Ireland had it not been for the influence of the Irish American community. They have been so influential and as I said, you know, Britain will never have solutions for Ireland. That colonialism, you know, they don't care. Nothing will ever make them move. But time and time again, we have seen that the Americans have come to our aid, that the Good Friday Agreement, again, came about, so, you know, mostly because there was pressure from America. They were so influential. I mean, back in that day when that agreement came about, you know, the IRA, the, the, they didn't really want to give up their arms. It was a big risk for them to give up their arms. And really, it was Martin McGuinness who saw an opportunity there. And, and one of the key things that happened was that the administration at that time agreed to let some of the well-known IRA men and, uh, come across to the U.S. and they gave them a visa. And so what happened there was that they were able to convince the Army Council of the IRA that people were serious about this. So that led to the IRA getting on board. And then, with the influence that the U.S. had with the British, again, they were really, really important and became guarantors of that agreement. So, you know, I wasn't here in America in those days, but really I know that's all down to you people and all the work that you did. So thank you so much for everything that you did for Ireland. Was your hat targeted merely because you owned it as why was it um, singled out in the Well, the honest answer to that is because probably it was singled out because of my brother. So my 15-year-old brother. Um, so he was targeted as seen because he would have attended the riots, he would have been targeted by the British, and then when he went on the run. So we were targeted mostly because of that. But in general, I can tell you living in the waterside, we lived there until I was age 14. Um, we had to move at that stage 
and that was not because we our neighbors forced us out but the difficulty was at that time there were so many sectarian murders and my brothers we would go they would go out my sisters also they would go across town to socialize at night because that's where the center of town was and there were so so many reports of young catholic boys young men coming across that bridge that we saw and trying to come into the waterside district who were attacked there were just gangs waiting for them and so my parents were just way too worried to let this continue and they knew that they had to get out for the safety of our family and move and then we moved to the city side of town but a lot of the targeting was because of my older brother Yeah. Could I, could I ask a medical question? Sure. Uh, which I think you would be supremely well qualified to answer. <laughs> Here, here's my, I'm the other historian in the audience, by the way, the big fellow who stood up and commended you. I absolutely second and would say, I want to be here when you're comfortable with public speaking. <laughs> but here's my medical question. If, since you know the American medical system so well, as well as the British and Irish systems, if Irish reunification comes as a result of Brexit or shortly thereafter, we know that German unification occurred 30 years ago, and there are still uh, problems that result from the discrepancies between the East and the West in reunification. My question, I think, would be, do you, as a medical person, think that were Irish reunification to occur, that the Republic of Ireland would be able to deal with what would probably be the inherent discrepancies, economic and otherwise, between the standard of care provided by the National Health Service in the current Northern Ireland and the standard of care that's available in the Republic. What, what would happen, in your view, how would, the, how would the two systems mesh, and how difficult would that be? Well, in a very short answer, I don't think it would be difficult. And I can draw on my own experiences, because before I came here, I worked in that uh, National Health Service, but I worked in a town called Straban. Sure. Straban was right on the border. Right. And once we had that Good Friday Agreement in place, we had lots of cross-border activities and agreements. Sure. And so, particularly within the medical community, so the nearest hospital for those across the border would have been Letter Kenny, and that would have been quite a bit away. Um, but Derry and Alma Galvin was much closer. So we had very, very close uh, agreements that we would take their patients, and they would take our patients, and we would go cross-border. And so that's my own personal experience, that that worked very, very well. The ambulances would just take patients to the closest hospital. And to be honest, that's one of the things that's in danger right now, because you know those those cross-border things that were set up then and have been established now for 25 years, they're actually all in danger. And then just to answer your your question on the economy again, I mean I don't know an awful lot about this, but I did listen to an excellent lecture um, from. Um, his name, I think, is Pierce Doherty. Uh, he is the uh, Sinn Féin representative for finance. And he debunked a lot of the, the myth around whether or not Southern Ireland could actually manage to deal with the economics of bringing the North in. And so uh, I don't have all those facts to, to hand right now. But he sold that story really, really well. And if you have questions, you know, you could probably find that his, his um, he gave a lecture and it's on Facebook and, you know, he really did a great job Wonderful. of answering all those questions. Thank you. Anybody else? <laughs> Absolutely wonderful, and 
Fisher kept her promise that it was only going to be about 30 minutes and just like was right through. <laughs> Wonderful. Hey, a couple of announcements before you run downstairs. And of course, Martin and Patricia are going to go down and we got a table reserved. People can have conversations with them, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, just to review though, uh, some of the no hard border in Ireland that Churchill was referring to, I did see Marie McGee, our chief lobbyist. It is, it can't be overemphasized enough, the pressure to put on a congressional delegation that the Good Friday Agreement be maintained and that the border should be in the Irish Sea. And it should have been there in 1920 and it should be there today. And maybe there's an opportunity to reunite the country with the right kind of pressure from America and of course from Ireland. Um, I just want to invite everybody, the next lecture is going to be here on October 25th. We always uh, have a monthly lecture. This is going to be tough to top, <laughs> and I am going to announce the speakers. Well, we do this occasionally. We are taking three different speakers covering three different topics or three different individuals. Our own Pat Brady is going to talk about Mother Jones, a famous Ooh, yeah. woman from Cork oh, yeah. who uh, it was a, a tremendous labor organizer, a tremendous life. There is still an online magazine called Mother Jones, and to this day in Cork, they honor her memory. She was a co-founder of the Industrial Workers of the World. Um, Sarah Benz is going to speak on Elaine Ryan Jolly, who was a Pawtucket woman, who at the turn of the century was the head of the um, Ladies Auxiliary of the AOH. In 1927, she published a book called Nuns of the Battlefield, where she researched the uh, Catholic nuns who were uh, nurses during the American Civil War. And uh, one of the reasons why Sarah is picking this is that this is the 100th anniversary of the founding of the Ladies Auxiliary of the AOH. Marie McGee, excuse me? 125th. 125th, isn't that what I said? <laughs> <laughs> okay, and last of all, Marie McGee is going to speak on a heroic figure who I'm sure Trish could give us a lot more information, Bernadette Devlin, who uh, uh, was not a Derry girl, but she moved to Derry. Maybe you can become a Derry girl after you move there. And she was one of the youngest women ever elected to the British Parliament at the age of 21. I think it was in 1970. She had an assassination attempt on her life. And we will fill you in all on that. The Cayley Club itself, tomorrow night, is having a very special event up here. It's called the Cayley Dance. Uh, it's with the Brendan Dolan and friends. and. Uh, uh, the Cayley dance, of course, uh, will be on the floor. This is uh, what the what the sign says. It's fifteen dollars for dancers, five dollars for toe tappers if you just want to watch the dance. <laughs> so anyway, and again, let's say uh, let's support the Cayley Club. There's information downstairs if you want to join, and there's uh, posters all around for um, the event tomorrow night. And the last thing I'm going to mention is a very very special night here. On October 12th, the Saturday night, a band is coming called the Men of the West. There are three men in it, Sean Sands, Barry Nelson, and Robbie Doyle. Sean Sands is Bobby Sands' brother, the first hunger striker to die. Sean has a connection to Rhode Island going back to 1971. When he spoke on a tour, he was 17 years old, he spoke at the Blondie Stone Pub. Uh, Sean has stayed in touch with the Doyle family. I mentioned in an email that he's an adopted member of the Doyle family. The other two men are master musicians. These are multiple instrumentalists and vocalists and everything like that. This is going to be a brilliant night. It's a $20 cover charge. It's $15 for the uh, members of the Cayley Club. And we're going to say that the enthusiasm that we've gotten from this is very, very high, okay? You might want to think about getting tickets early. George Doyle is selling tickets, I'm selling tickets, and tickets are available downstairs at the pub and will be to the night of the concert. But there's a limit on the number of tickets, so I, I wouldn't be surprised if it's sold off. So just, if you want to hear a great night of traditional Irish music, rebel Irish music, these guys are international, uh, played for a long time, and I understand two of them this is probably the last time they're going to go come to America to play. It's like kind of a farewell tour for them, okay? So with that, I want to thank my
Martin and Trisha for a great presentation tonight. Thank everybody for coming out and hopefully let us stay on the one road until Ireland is free again, okay? We'll see you downstairs.